given a special challenge next week, teamed up with Paul McDonald and Philippa Baker against other international sides of sports people in trailblazers. But to return to the coast to coast, it's a test of your limits, a test of how much pain you can stand, a competition with yourself as much as with the others. It's a personal challenge, you see. And the fact that there was a $42,000 BMW available if you could get there in under 11 hours might just have helped as well. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Space Coast to Coast for the uh, Space Longest Day, the World Championship Kayak Cycle Run, the one-day event from Kumara to Sumner. The objective for competitors in the Space Coast to Coast is to cross New Zealand running, cycling and kayaking. So you could have a tailwind as you're going across the plane. Why don't you just roll back to the surface here and we'll try to get the brakes away on time. Watch out of the way, man. They'll come. They'll run you down. Four, three, two, one, go! This year marks the ninth running of this gruelling event. The race is divided into two sections, the one-day world championship for individuals and the two-day event where competitors, and it is either individuals or teams, camp at the halfway mark overnight. This year's race is more than just 238 kilometres of gruelling, cycling, running and kayaking. There's the chance to break the elusive 11-hour barrier and claim a new BMW. After missing out on the car by six minutes last year, Steve Gurney knows exactly what he's up against. It's going to be very hard. It is, there's a small chance that we'll get it. The winner in 1988 and 1989, Australian John Jacoby, is determined to make this year number three. He wants to claim the car. I was fairly sceptical about it before I came over, but I've had a couple of paddles on the river and it looks at a really good level. And I think it's got a very big chance of being broken, especially if Norwest gets up. For most competitors, the 60-kilometre first cycle leg from Kamara Beach to the Deception River is a matter of keeping up and keeping out of trouble. You know, with a bunch that big, you're just crazy sitting too far back in case someone goes down. It's much safer to be up the front and the leads weren't tough, that's for sure. I had to think of myself later on for breaking the 11 hours and let the other guys do some of the work. I did a couple of laps up the front, but nothing much. Cruising along in a bunch holds no appeal for Xerox Challenge winner, Kathy Lynch. I've got that attitude when I get on a bike, you just put your head down your bum up and you just go for it. And it produces results every time. On target for the BMW, the leading competitors had to be at the Deception River footbridge, completing the first cycle leg in one hour 45. Party, party. At the first transition, the leaders are John Jacoby, followed by Jim Bedwell, Trevor Allen and Jeff Mitchell. First away from the transition is John Jacoby. Back on 11 hour pace, they'll need a good fast run through the mountain, and that requires local knowledge. King of the mountain is the 1987 race winner Russell Prince. For international competitors like John Jacoby, following Prince is once again part of his plan. Just the same as other years to follow Russell or Steve or whoever's in front, because I don't really know my way up there. Number 28, Murray Chapman, is also sticking closely to the King of the Mountain. When you're able to follow someone, you don't have to think about what you're doing, and that makes it very easy. My plan was basically just to follow someone who knew the course, and I was pretty confident of being able to keep up with Russell, so I decided I'd follow him. If he was too quick for me, well, uh, Steve Gurney coming up, um, 
behind who, uh, who, I, sh who I, in theory, should have been able to follow. Two minutes behind the leaders, Gurney is making himself very hard to follow. As they work their way up the valley, Prince can't shake the ever-present Jacoby and Chapman. Not far behind, Gurney has them in sight. I was very surprised to find Russell slowed up there and he had um, tagging right on his heels with John Jacoby and Murray Chapman. They just stuck together the whole way. So those three guys just like, you know, having a train up the top. During the 23-kilometre run, competitors traverse the Southern Alps through Goats Pass. Leading the field into big boulders is Russell Prince, the effects of stomach cramp obviously slowing him down. Normally I'd clear out on the mountain run really early on and they have to find their own, own way through, which would have cost them a lot of time and um, I would have had quite a large advantage at the end of the mountain run normally. Gurney narrows the gap with every step. You gotta work with your muscle. You gotta dance or dance with your feet. The wrong side of the river can be a very lonely place. Make sure he gives you good advice. When I need, I need more than good luck. By the time Prince, Jacoby and Chapman get within sight of Goats Pass, Gurney is right on their heels and pushing hard. On the last stretch to Goats Pass, Gurney picks them off one by one. But over the top, Prince is back in the lead. As they come out of the bush on the final part of the run to Klondike Corner, a determined Prince holds his lead over a badly limping gurney. I think both J John Jacoby and Murray Chapman did an excellent run. And um, Russell had something wrong, so he didn't do as fast a run as he should have. And then I sprained my ankle. <laughs> Usually happens that way, you know, you're going over all these treacherous, slippery rocks, and you're concentrating, and then you get to a nice, flat, easy piece, and, uh, and then you think, oh, I can relax a bit here, and then, well, over you go. With a further 20 minutes to Klondike Corner, Gurney desperately tries to hang on. Klondike Corner marks a psychological halfway point in the Spates coast to coast. Klondike Corner is where the 500 men and women who compete in the two-day event camp overnight after their first day. Their Spates coast to coast is no battle for a BMW, it's a personal challenge that started early the day before on Kamara Beach. For all of them, the Spates is something special. Good to mix with young people and have them call you Bruce. My husband did it last year and I seconded to him and thought, hey, this looks like a laugh. Just enjoy it. <laughs> I mean, it's the best, okay. best event there. Once you get started, that's half the battle. Let's go!
21-year-old Doug Lomax won the longest day veterans title last year. For Doug, the two-day is taking it easy. Five years, I've alternated now. I've done one day, two day, one day, two day, one day. Yeah, you know, I find the two day more enjoyable for me, for my... So I like having a rest and meeting a lot of people. Yeah, you know, I've met so many people on the coast to coast, new friends and things since I've been doing the events. It's sort of half the thing where I like doing the two day. So one day's pretty lonely. At the end of the cycle leg, it's a quick change and off up the mountain. 59-year-old Dave Moran, number 527, has entered in a family team with his son, Stephen. Well, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I came last year as a, a team support for uh, my son here. And, uh, and you tend to get caught up in the spirit of the thing, and, uh, and you open your mouth, and away you go. And, uh, you know, I suppose I'm getting older, and this is probably my last chance of doing it, so I'm, I'm having a go, and that's it. Anne Connor was her husband's second last year and is competing for the first time. I can be part of what Rod's sort of feeling. I'll know what it's like now. Whereas before, I, you know, it wasn't quite the same being a seconder. Amongst the competitors and seconds and everything, it's just terrific, you know. It's just one big family. It's, it's a really good feeling. Everybody helps each other along the way. It's really good. It's a very cold and wet goat's pass that greets the competitors. Yeah, we're not going the other way. Yeah, it's a bit cold. Beautiful day. For too long, the whole world passed you by. That's when you know that it's time. Could be time to play that wild card. Be that. of the bush and onto the final run through the Minga Riverbed to Klondike Corner. Sixth ride, right down the finish, will be Anne Connor from Barstead to Nearside. Well done, David. Uh, good to see you here at Klondike and uh, the finish for day one. After a night's rest and relaxation, the competitors in the two-day event will continue their journey to Sumner Beach in Christchurch. Down Brome Street. They start day two in groups of ten with a 15-kilometre cycle to the Mount White Bridge where they begin the arduous kayak section. Meanwhile, just two hours and 51 minutes after the two-day competitors departed, Russell Prince leads the one-day competitors into Klondike Corner.
At the end of the mountain run, the leading four are all less than a minute apart and have slipped almost 10 minutes behind 11-hour pace. With the weight off his painfully sore ankle, Gurney uses the short 18-kilometre cycle to the Mount White Bridge to make a decisive break. No, I felt very good for that cycle, and I, I gained a bit of time on John and certainly Russell, and I caught Murray Chapman up. Into the river, Gurney and Chapman are locked together, but Jacoby and Prince are right behind them. The World Marathon kayak champion John Jacoby is already showing his strength on the river, passing Chapman and setting his sights on the leader, Steve Gurney. First woman onto the river is number 51, Penny Webster. When you've got two minutes on Linda at the end of the ride, and Kathy's wasted. Oh, bring it! Bring it! <laughs> Unfortunately for Penny, Kathy Lynch was to prove anything but wasted. After two hours paddling, Steve Gurney is nearly halfway through the 67-kilometre kayak section, expecting Jacoby to be right behind him. I expected him to catch me, and I, I just assumed he was right up my date, and um, just paddled like crazy. I didn't look back, I just paddled like crazy, and he never caught me, so I was very pleased with my paddle. After starting the kayak one and a half minutes behind Gurney, Jacoby is now over eight minutes back and in trouble. I got into the paddle, and my arms were really sore from the run. All my forearms are sort of blowing up, and I thought oh, I'll, I'll be able to work that out all right. And then by the time I worked that out, I just the backside on the seat just started to ache really badly, and I just couldn't concentrate and had to stop paddling and lean back all the time to take the pressure off. I just never got wound up on the paddle. Less than five metres behind Jacoby, Chapman was also feeling the strain. I saw John Jacoby go into it and I saw him do a wee bit of a support stroke and I thought, I'd better watch this. Um, and I just, yeah, lack of concentration. I, I went into it without really thinking and, uh, and got caught and, uh, and had four attempts at rolling, but, uh, but I was a bit tired and it only got half up each time. And so, uh, so I had to get out. And that cost me about five or six minutes, which, which is really frustrating um, because, of course, that was uh, when Russell caught me. Um, um, but uh, that's the way it goes. Russell Prince paddling strongly has Chapman and Jacoby in his sights. The leaders have now caught and passed the last of the two dayers, who will be on the water for over seven and a half hours. The Wymac River is higher than last year, but still not as high as Steve Gurney would have liked. The Wymac was higher last weekend. It, was, it would have been easy for 11 hours to be broken then, but it's dropped all week. And it's not as low as it was last year, but it's still going to be very hard to break 11 hours. Russell Prince has moved into second place on the river. Gurney approaches the Gorge Bridge, and at the end of the kayak leg, an awesome 15 minutes clear. The race against John Jacoby is over. Given that I mean it's be harsh here, but kayak is his strength, and if he can't take it to Steve in the kayak, then he's not going to take it anywhere else. So, uh, so from our point of view, <laughs> that's a good thing. So now it's just a matter of whether we can get to the car or not.
Having completed the kayak leg in record time, Steve Gurney must push his tired, aching body through a 70-kilometre cycle in under two hours. And one of his worst fears has happened. The forecast nor'westerly tailwind is now an easterly headwind that he must battle all the way. I'm going to go, let go, let go. With three of the four legs completed, Gurney is the only one left on target for the BMW. His kayak is over 30 minutes faster than Jacoby's race record. Gurney holds the race record for this final cycle section with a time of 1 hour 35 minutes 40 seconds, set using his outlawed pod. Its aerodynamics saved him an estimated 15 to 20 minutes. Without it, he must battle alone against time and Canterbury's infamous easterly. To keep Steve aware of his relative position and the average speed needed to break the 11-hour barrier, his team have devised an ingenious pit board system. Well, they knew how far it was uh, from where I was to the finish, and so every now and then they'd do a calculation and figure out what speed I have to maintain to make it in time to the finish. Because the previous years, I've usually died on that last cycle. One thing that did worry me was that we were predicted to have a, or well, the weather prediction was for a northwest, and we ended up getting an easterly, a headwind all the way. So it usually strengthens with the coastal sea breezes, usually strengthens once we get to Christchurch, but it didn't. It. With less than half an hour to go, Gurney has entered the Garden City still 14 kilometres and 26 minutes from Sumner Beach. His lead over second place, Russell Prince, is now over 20 minutes. Nothing except mechanical disaster can prevent him from finishing first. The race to break the 11-hour barrier and claim the car is far from over. At the finish line on the beach at Sumner, the tension's mounting. ...able to establish that Steve Gurney is rapidly approaching Sumner Beach. He has five and a half minutes, according to our reckoning. ...towards the distance. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen. And Steve Gurney... Around about four hours, 50, uh, four minutes, 50 seconds now. Here it is. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Steve Gurney. Oh, magnificent. Oh, what an effort. Get out, you Steve Gurney. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it has taken Steve Gurney 10 hours, 56 minutes and 14 seconds to cross New Zealand from the Tasman to the Pacific, a distance of 238 kilometres. Now he can drive home in a BMW.